Hello, my little WAP stars. Today's podcast on the Renaissance is brought to you by my third cup of coffee today at 9.04 in the morning. We do what we got to do. Let's dive in and talk about these amazing works of art and how they came to be. You can thank these two people right here, the Medici family. Now, briefly mentioned them in my last podcast. What you should know is that they were the most powerful family in Florence. They start out as wealthy cloth merchants and they rise politically because they end up becoming bankers. And essentially, these people ran Florence. Um, just to give you an example of how powerful they were, for her 16th birthday, Catherine Medici was made the Queen of France. My 16th birthday, I got a CD player. It's all good. Uh, but this is who these people were, guys. They were patrons of the arts, very powerful politically and economically. And you're going to see how that influence extends out. So when we're looking at the rise of Europe into the Renaissance, so remember, we are out of the Dark Ages now. The feudal system has ended. Thank you, the Black Plague. And now we're looking at how urbanization is going to improve the status of women. So the code of chivalry among knights called for respect of women. And as you see the rise of religion, you'll see increased veneration of the Virgin Mary. Mary symbolized the ideals of love, womanhood, and sympathy. Urbanization created more job opportunities for women, and you'll also see the rise of all female guilds and women working the same jobs as their husband. Now, guys, compared to previous times when we see the rise of urbanization, we see the lessening of a woman's place in society, women not being allowed to work, women being seen as second class citizens. Um, you do see while women are still secondary, they're actually allowed to work outside the home. And we're going to talk more about that later on. Gothic cathedrals are these masterpieces that were built in the late medieval period. They define medieval architecture and craftsmanship. They have a very distinctive style and you can see the pointed Gothic arch, high towers, you see interiors lit with these massive windows. And the men who designed these had no actual formal training in engineering. They learned through trial and error. If they were building and they made a mistake, they fixed it and then kept going. And these structures were so large that their height would remain unmatched until the 19th century. The Renaissance or the rebirth. So after 1100, Western Europeans gained access to the Greek and Arabic works on science, philosophy, and medicine. Again, silver lining of the Crusades. These manuscripts were translated by Jewish scholars and then studied at Christian monasteries, which remained the primary centers of learning. But after 1200, we'll see the rise of colleges and universities becoming the new center of learning. And they were actually modeled off of the universities in Spain, which were modeled off of the universities that would be seen in Baghdad. Universities specialized in particular branches of learning. Some colleges were established by the students, and at first they were teaching guilds established by professors to oversee training and control membership. But later, you're going to see the specific interests of different professions being housed within specific universities. So Bologna was famous for its law faculty. You have other colleges known for theology or medicine. And theology was the most prominent discipline of this period because the theologians sought to synthesize rational philosophy of the Greeks with the Christian faith of the Latin West, so essentially Catholicism. And this intellectual movement was known as scholasticism. In the middle of the 14th century, there was a marked increase in the pace of intellectual and artistic life. This is what we call the Renaissance. And one of the most important works that we'll see in the Renaissance is Summa Theologica by Thomas Aquinas, who was a scholastic scholar. I hate saying that because it's redundant, but whatever, that's what it says. He's um, In this period, he's using Christian beliefs and Aristotle reasoning. Again, that's scholasticism. In the Italian Renaissance, it's very important to know why it's starting in Italy. So it's not just the urban growth and wealth. 
It's not just the merchant class values. It's not just classical heritage. It's where the money is. And this this renaissance was not cheap, guys. Uh, but that's where you have powerful families and city-states. So Italy is not unified. You have Florence. You have Rome. You have Milan. They're run by different people. And that also enables the renaissance to grow. The main idea was humanism. The study of human beings and their potential, the celebration of human life. And there's a lot of different approaches, history, grammar, poetry, rhetoric, law, literature. Guys, this is what the humanities are. So we can include language. We can include music. Uh, that's what we're looking at here. And some works of art you should know. This is where we'll see Da Vinci, the Vitruvian Man, the Mona Lisa. Uh, you'll soon see Shakespeare emerging a little down the road. Uh, but then there's also the Prince Niccolo Machiavelli, who came up with It is Better to Be Feared Than Loved if you cannot be both. And that is his advice on government. S solid. All right. So the humanists. Dante, you might know him from Dante's Inferno. Uh, that's the most famous of his works from Dante's The Divine Comedy. And The Divine Comedy tells the story of the author's journey through the nine layers of hell and his entry into paradise. Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is a very rich portrayal of the lives of everyday people in late medieval England on a pilgrimage. Both of these are works of satire, which is the use of irony and humor to really expose the hypocrisy, stupidity, or evil within humanity. And what you should know about the Canterbury Tales, it's the first time that you see a mixing of social classes that had never been done before. Um, you should know that through marriage, Chaucer is actually the great, 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 great uncle of Henry VIII. So all these families, they're all interrelated, guys. All these people are related. Dante influenced the intellectual movement of the humanists. And as we know, humanists will have a tremendous influence on the reform of secondary education, again, through our discussion of colleges and universities. Continuing on, some humanists wrote in the vernacular, and that's the language of everyday people. Most of them worked in Latin, and many worked to restore the original texts of Latin and Greek authors and of the Bible through a very exhaustive comparative analysis. As a part of this enterprise, Pope Nicholas V established the Vatican Library, and the Dutch humanist Erasmus produced a critical edition of the New Testament. And there is a saying that Erasmus laid the egg that Martin Luther hatched, and we'll be discussing Martin Luther a little ways down the road. You also see the influence of humanists in terms of printing, better ink, an improved movable type were developed, but then Gutenberg took it one step further, and he perfected the art of printing in 1454 with the printing press. His press, and more than 200 others like it, produced at least 10 million printed works by 1500. Guys, what you need to know about this, the Renaissance didn't impact everyone. It really only impacted the people who, who knew how to read. So peasants were not really impacted by this at all. It's the upper classes. We're looking at about 10% of the population, maybe 15%, who are going to gain a lot of knowledge from all these amazing works of art and all of this improving technology. So even though it's the rebirth, for most of society, it's not. But what we'll see, guys, throughout the 14th and 15th century is improve artwork. So natural paintings will be uh, improved upon. Uh, it's a new perspective, if you will. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, but what you can see, guys, in this art is it's not realistic. Like the people should not be as tall as the buildings. Um, it's very two dimensional and it's all religious in nature. And that's going to change. We're going to see realism. We're going to see paintings done to scale. Uh, we'll also see a style that concentrates on the depiction of Greek and Roman gods and scenes from daily life or other 
biblical scenes modeled on the Greek style or scenes of everyday life modeled on the Greek style. Religion still played a very important role, especially because the location of the Vatican in relation to where the Renaissance was born. But you also see changing, changing styles and changing values. So what we're looking at here are two statues of the David, the first by Donatella, 1440, and the second by Michelangelo. That's in 1501. And we're looking at first a bronze statue of the David. And what you see, he has longer hair. Um, he has a more wiry build, very slender. Uh, and then we see the David by Michelangelo. He has shorter hair. He's more muscular. And what we're looking at, guys, this is also made out of marble, is changing what the ideal man was. So in the, in the 15th century, so the 1400s, the ideal man didn't have to do physical labor. He could pay someone to do that for him. And he was very slender and had longer hair. But by the 16th century, you have the Renaissance man. And the Renaissance man was not only intellectual, he was also athletic. He was also artistic. And that's where you see this in David by Michelangelo. Um, you'll also notice that the bronze statue, if you look at the way Donatella's David is bent at the knee. That's because this statue is so heavy. Had Donatello not redistributed the weight, that statue would cave in on itself. It is that heavy. This is Michelangelo. Uh, as you can also see here, this statue that he made of Mary cradling the body of Jesus is also not done to scale. Um, there's been studies done, and for her to do that, she would have to be eight feet tall. Um, sorry about that. Um, and it's still a masterpiece because this is all carved from one piece of marble by hand. So if you mess up, you either keep going or you get, you get a new piece of marble, you start over. He's also known for the Sistine Chapel. Now, he did not paint all of this, but the most famous, right here, God and Adam, the creation of man. Da Vinci, looking at all of his artworks, but also his inventions. Now, Da Vinci studied human form and actually went to medical schools to observe dissection of the human body, and then he drew what he saw in very specific detail. He also invented, well, invented the concept, I should say, of a giant crossbow that took dozens of people to operate, as well as an idea of the first flying machine. You'll also notice the Last Supper and then his self-portrait. The School of Athens by Raphael. Raphael reintroduced the idea of painting and drawing to scale. He was an Italian painter. Uh, he died quite young, but this is what he is best known for. And he had quite a number of techniques, and he liked to incorporate people into his paintings. So if you look carefully, you can actually see himself in this painting. He incorporated Michelangelo as well as Leonardo da Vinci. The Northern Renaissance. So two very famous painters. We have Jan van Eyck, and then we have Vermeer, most famous for Girl with a Pearl Earring. That's all we have for today. If you have any questions, send me an email. Otherwise, have a great night, y'all. Cheers.